Hello, everyone. My name is Lisa Carter, and I'm the Vice Provost for Libraries here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'd like to take a moment before we start to acknowledge the history of the land on which we are meeting tonight. Humans have called this place home for 12,000 years and counting. We as a university community continue to create and build upon our partnerships with the 12 First Nations of Wisconsin. Today, the university rests in the ancestral land of the Ho-Chunk Nation, the people of the big voice who have called this place De Jope for time and memorial. It is perhaps particularly important to recognize this history at today's event which is focused on the damages done to our natural environment by those who came and displaced Native, many Native American people. Thank you. And I would now like to welcome Chancellor Rebecca Blank to the stage. Good evening, everyone. I am delighted to be here and I'm delighted to welcome all of you to our Go Big Read 2018. Go Big Read is celebrating its 10th anniversary this year. In a book club this massive does not organize itself. It takes a lot of dedicated staff working behind the scenes. So I wanna thank three people who led that effort. Vice Provost and University Librarian Lisa Carter, who you just heard from. Sheila Steckel, who directs our library teaching and learning programs, is in charge of organizing the specifics around Go Big Read. And Jules Arnstorf, who's our instruction and outreach librarian. Thank you to all the libraries work on this. I also want to thank Professor Jake Vanderzanden, who's director of our Center for Limnology and chair of water at UW-Madison, which is a vast network of researchers and students from across campus who are working on water-related issues. Jake is going to facilitate a question and answer session after Dan Egan's remarks, so think about all your questions as you're listening. I chose the, uh, the death and life of the Great Lakes as this year's Go Big Read for a whole number of reasons. First, it chronicles a series of events worthy of analysis and discussion, ecological disasters that have and will continue to affect us here in the upper Midwest in many different ways. The book suggests future potential policy choices, some of which will deepen the disaster and some of which will help heal what has happened in the past. Second, the book is written by a journalist, and not just any journalist, but an outstanding Wisconsin journalist who's been honored with multiple national awards. Dan Egan knows how to turn an important science story into a page turner. And if you've read the book, you know he's just a great storyteller. It is no surprise this book has been a top 10 New York Times bestseller and was chosen last spring for the PBS NewsHour New York Times Book Club. And third, the Death and Life of the Great Lakes deals with a subject that many of our readers here in Madison and on campus are personally connected to. I love this statistic. 80% of our students come from a state or a province that borders the Great Lakes. Everything from New York through Ohio and all the way around to Ontario. Many of you have spent a lot of time fishing, swimming, boating, or just enjoying the beautiful view out over one of the Great Lakes. This book illustrates the impact we have had over them over time. As Dan writes, the greatest threat to the Great Lakes right now is our own ignorance. We're doing our part to change that. I'm happy to say that the death and life of the Great Lakes is generating lots of conversations on this campus and in our community. We distributed 6,000 copies to new freshmen at convocation last month, and we have more than 150 class sections reading the book, ranging from biology to political science to nursing to ecology. There are also a number of community groups reading, along with um, faculty, staff, and students, and they're joining us here tonight. Nearly 500 people on the Madison Public Library waiting list. And I'll have to say that's only second to Crazy Rich Asians, which I happened to look at two weeks ago, and that had 950 people on the waiting list. We have 1,000 people here in person, and we anticipate another 1,000 are going to be watching the webcast. So we're in for a fascinating discussion, and if you haven't read or haven't finished the book, I suggest that you do so. Before I turn this over, um, let me tell you just a little bit about Dan Egan. He grew up in Green Bay, and both sets of grandparents had summer homes on Door County. How lucky is that? Um, so he got to know and love Lake Michigan from a very early age. 
Dan has covered the Great Lakes for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel since 2003. He has twice been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, and he's won several national awards for journalism. He is at present a senior fellow in water policy at UW-Milwaukee School of Freshwater Sciences. And I won't hold this against him after last Saturday. He's a graduate of the University of Michigan <laughs> and the Columbia School of Journalism. Dan and his wife and four children live outside of Milwaukee. Please join me in a very warm welcome for Dan Egan. Dan. Thank you so much. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor, for that nice introduction. <laughs> this is a big auditorium. Um, this is a real thrill. I, I'm a, a son of Wisconsin, or actually probably a great-grandson of Wisconsin. I love this state. Uh, I love this uh, university. And when I heard that the book was selected, I was doing you know, backflips, <laughs> literally. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, about myself and about how I came to write this book and touch on some of the issues of the book. It's not going to be a book report. Um, it's just going to be kind of a free-flowing you know, who I am and, and how I came to be standing on this stage in front of all these people. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's see if this works. As the Chancellor mentioned, I am a uh, native of Green Bay, and, and that is my hometown. It's, it's not necessarily a, a glamour shot. I don't know what year it was taken, but I know I was born in 1967. And uh, at that time, and to this day, uh, the Fox River, which runs through the middle of the town, is one of the most heavily industrialized, hardest working rivers anywhere in North America and in some ways the world. At some point there were, I think, 37 pulp and paper mills along this river. And as I mentioned, I was born in 1967. So that would, you know, make me maybe a nine or a 10 year old in the mid 1970s before the Clean Water Act really took effect. And I spent a lot of time playing on the banks of that river on the left side up toward the top of the picture around what is the Deep Here Dam, and I remember, you know, it was just natural for, for us as kids to see, you know, even then there, there, were, there were sewer pipes that would at times discharge from the river. We'd also play on the banks, and it, it made my parents very nervous. I don't think they were so afraid that we were going to fall in and drown. It was more like playing at the dump, and it's, it's sad to say that, but that was the case. Um, in, in particular, I remember picking up these little nuggets of sulfur off the riverbank, and we would bring them home <laughs> and light them on fire, like a low-grade firework. And it would, you know, ooze like lava and have this awful stench. And, you know, I remember thinking, oh, this is nature's bounty. You know, <laughs> it, was, it was only later that I learned it was, you know, an unfortunate byproduct of the, uh, the pulp-making process. It was sulfur precipitating out. And it's, it's, it's worth mentioning that both my dad and my grandfather were in the paper and, and pulp business, so their hands, and I guess to a certain degree my hands, aren't perfectly clean in this story of what went wrong with this river. But things got better over time really fast with the passage of the Clean Water Act. It really did throttle what industry was allowed to put into the river. And, you know, if, if you were to go up there today, you know, where I was plucking sulfur off the riverbanks, they now have walleye fishing tournaments that draw so many boats you could, you know, walk across the river from boat to boat without getting your feet wet. I only bring this up because this is like my first exposure to Great Lakes water because this river flows into Lower Green Bay, which is an arm of Lake Michigan. It wasn't my only experience. As the Chancellor mentioned, I had two cents of grandparents who had uh, summer homes up on the Door Peninsula. When I found this picture, I thought it was Algoma, but I think it's Frankfurt. The point is the same. Even in, even in the 70s, the lakes farther north from Green Bay, and particularly Chicago, were, were still spectacular. They were still, you know, relatively fish-filled and cold and clear and safe to swim in. And, you know, they... You don't realize it when you're a kid, but things are getting imprinted on you that, that stay with you. And, and this, you know, I never, would have, I never would have gotten into the field that I, that I got into had I not been exposed to these lakes in this manner when I was a kid. 
after I graduated from college, I headed out west. And this is relevant to my, because I guess when you write a book, a lot of what happened in your life becomes relevant. Um, I took a job at the uh, Idaho Mountain Express in Ketchum, Idaho, which is in, in the middle of Idaho near the Sawtooth Mountains. And one of my first assignments, this is the summer of 1992, was to go up to this place called Redfish Lake where they were having a vigil for the return of the sockeye, uh, Snake River sockeye salmon. And I don't know what you can read off of this screen here, but things were not going well for the Snake River sockeye in 1992. Uh, they could track, so these fish would swim, they would, they would, be, they would start their life in this lake some 7,000 feet above sea level and 900 miles inland, and then they would tumble down the Salmon River into the Snake, into the Columbia, out to the ocean, and then after two or three years, they'd make their trip all the way back to Redfish Lake, hence the name Redfish Lake. They would turn a crimson when it was time to spawn and die and let the cycle repeat itself. Well, the, the cycle was choking when I got there. This particular summer, there were eight fish that had been tracked passing the last dam on the migration. There were eight big hydroelectric dams and they, could, they had fish ladders. They could actually count the fish as they came and they had eight. And then once they get past the last dam, I don't remember, it's still two or 300 miles and then it's just nail biting. Are they, is any gonna make it back? And uh, this particular summer, uh, one fish made it back. His name's uh, Lonesome Larry. And uh, he was mounted in that lonesome way. <laughs> it's a dirty joke. Um, they, they used his, his milt in a captive breeding program, which is keeping uh, th this species of, of fish off the, uh, off the extinction list for now. But it really made an impression on me that standing on the banks of this redfish creek back in 1992, you know, with maybe 50 to 75 people, watching a, a whole species just disappear. It was, it was, it was really it was profound, um, but there's no other way to explain it. I, I stayed out west for about 10 years, and I did a fair amount of environmental reporting. And then in 2002, I moved back to my home state, um, not to Green Bay, but to Milwaukee, and I took a job at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. And I remember uh, one of my first uh, weekends here, I was walking along the Milwaukee Harbor with my, uh, my daughter, who is here tonight. She's now 17. Back then, she was 18 months or so. And um, we moved back with some trepidation because I loved the wildness of the West. But uh, when we got to the lake this one day, uh, they, th this isn't a picture from that day, but the salmon had come in to spawn, the Lake Michigan salmon. And I remember thinking, this is neat, you know, maybe Milwaukee doesn't have the mountains, but it's got a, a, a heck of a lake. And there's no better way to appreciate a great lake than to live for a decade in the desert. You look at it completely differently. And, and I, I couldn't believe all the people who were, who were fishing for the salmon just down, just in the, you know, the downtown harbor front. But there was something weird going on. I'd studied enough and learned enough about uh, salmon spawning activity to realize that some of these fish on that particular day were trying to fin their way up these boat ramps, like, you know, ever swimming upstream. And I asked the fisherman, what, what are they doing? Aren't they here to spawn? And he said to me, you know, these fish are basically born to be caught. They can't spawn. They were planted three years ago, and they are basically um, there for the enjoyment of the sports fishermen. Now, this blew my mind because Though I'm a native of Wisconsin and I knew that the Great Lakes had salmon, I didn't really know how or why. I had some vague idea that they might have been planted at some point, but I didn't know that at this point it was really kind of a put and take fishery. And one of the jobs of being a reporter is to, if you get interested in something, to pursue it. And I go back to my newsroom and I suggest to my boss that uh, we do a story on the salmon. And he says, everybody knows the story of the salmon. Well, after talking to people for two or three weeks, I realized that everybody didn't know the story of the salmon, and I went back into his office, and I made the pitch again, and he said, well, if you want to go back that far, you know, why don't you start at the beginning? So here we are. <laughs> <laughs> the Great Lakes are, are you know, they're incredible. Incredibly young. They're, they're archaeologists are finding, you know, on Lake Huron evidence of settlement on what is now, you know, 100 feet below water. This, there's a lake in, in Siberia that's 25 million years old. The, the Great Lakes as we know them are 4,000 or 2,500 years old. 
And a, and a common misperception is that they, they were uh, filled by the glaciers. And they, they, they weren't. They might have been originally, but they were carved by the glaciers. They carved these indentations in the ground. And, and when they retreated and that ice melted, the water flowed into them and they filled up. And they became the five great lakes that look a little bit better from this perspective. I like this. This is west to east. It kind of makes you look at them a little bit differently, and that's kind of what I'm in the business of doing. And so what we're looking at here, furthest on the left, is, is the Superior, and then Michigan and Huron, which you know, really are one lake. Uh, they're two lobes of the same body of water, which would technically make them the largest lake by surface area in the world, but I'm not going to get into that with the people from Lake Superior. <laughs> if you look down below, there's Lake Erie, and then there's Lake Ontario below that. What, what this picture from space doesn't show is the reality on the ground. I mentioned earlier that a lot of people think that the lakes are just filled glacial meltwater. Oops, got a little bit ahead here. Um, they're not. They're, they're actually like a, they're like a river. Superior, I, I don't know if you, if, if, if you can grasp this graphic, but the, but the body of water on the left is Lake Superior, and that's at the top of this chain of lakes, and they all flow into each other. Superior dumps into Michigan and Huron, Michigan and Huron dumps into Erie, Erie into Ontario, and Ontario out to the sea. So they're a dynamic system, ever emptying and ever filling up. It's another way to look at them, a classic map. Now, it was maps like this that, in a way, kind of doomed, doomed the Great Lakes as, as we knew them historically, because if you look at this, you can see that blue tendril, the St. Lawrence River, going out to the Gulf of St. Lawrence, which is the North Atlantic. And when you look at this on the map, that's just tantalizing if you're trying to settle a continent. You're thinking, that's how we get inland. Um, the reality on the ground is, is a little different. Uh, the St. Lawrence River, in its natural state, was just wild. It dropped some 250 feet from, from uh, Lake Ontario down to Montreal. There were walls of rapids, walls of water that were just Im impassable to, to any kind of a, a boat for thousands of years. And on the western side, I hope the slide can show it, but the yellow, this faint yellow area is important because that's the Great Lakes watershed. And that means that any drop of water that falls inside that yellow area goes into the Great Lakes and ultimately out the St. Lawrence River to the ocean. And if you look over by Chicago, it is remarkably close to the lakeshore. It's a matter of maybe six miles. But that was an important, uh, an important distinction because any raindrop that fell on left or west of that divide went into the Mississippi River. So the lakes were really vast as they are. I mean, they're 94,000 square miles, which is about the size of the United Kingdom. They have 10,000 miles of shoreline, which is more shoreline than the Atlantic and the Pacific combined. But in a lot of ways, they were isolated as a Northwood pond because nothing could swim up the St. Lawrence River and, and colonize Lake Ontario. And no water, there was no water connection, permanent water connection at Chicago either. So they were their own unique ecosystem. And even if something could get up the St. Lawrence River, once it got to Lake Ontario, it would move on to Lake Erie. And before it gets to Lake Erie, you hit Niagara Falls. And things could tumble out of the lakes, but nothing could get into the lakes. And we couldn't stand that. You know, we, we wanted boats and stuff coming into the lakes and products going out of the lakes. So we started trying to connect them to the rest of the world. And the first big chink, I like to think of the, and I, I organize it in the book this way, Chicago and the, that, that whole side is like the lake's back door and, and the St. Lawrence River was the front door. And, and they were largely closed to the outside world until Lake Erie was the first, the first chink, the first crack in this door. That was built, uh, I think it opened in 1825. And that, that bypassed Niagara Falls. That, that gave boats a shot from uh, New York Harbor. A boat could sail up the Hudson River and then take a left and take a 343 or so mile uh, trip on a canal, the Erie Canal, that would plop it at Lake, Lake Erie. And from Lake Erie, it was, a, it was a navigable sail all the way to Chicago. So that's what the U.S. did. And the Canadians couldn't stand that we had unlocked the continent like this. So they were working busily on their own canal system. 
they were trying to punch right up the St. Lawrence River by building locks and canals and channels to tame these rapids. And, and they started that in 1689. And then four years after we opened the Erie Canal, they built their own canal around Niagara Falls, connecting Huron or connecting Ontario to Lake Erie. So suddenly the lakes were open to the rest of the world, a bit. The original Erie Canal was about four feet deep and it was maybe four feet wide and it could handle barges. The Canadians were always more ambitious. They wanted big schooners, sailing vessels, to be able to make their way out to the East Coast, into the lakes, to the East Coast and beyond. And they kept chipping away. They kept ever expanding their Welling Canal to the point that in the 1930s, it was handling ships that were almost 800 feet long and 80 feet wide. But these were like oversized ships in an oversized bottle because they couldn't get down the St. Lawrence River because the canal, the, the channels and the locks weren't big enough at that point. So finally, once and for all, in the 1950s, the US and Canada got together and they decided they were just gonna kick this front door down with the construction of the St. Lawrence Seaway, which was really taming the St. Lawrence River. The Welling Canal was already in existence. Um, this was the largest earth moving project in history. The water still flowed, as gravity dictates, downhill, but now it flowed through a system that could handle what were considered at the time really big boats. And what's hard to grasp is how excited everybody was in the Midwest about this at that time. People were convinced that Buffalo, Duluth, Green Bay, uh, Chicago were going to become world-class ports to rival anything on the coasts. This is a little excerpt from my newspaper, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, talking about the busy traffic coming into the, uh, the port in 1959, the, the first season that it was open. Um, the idea was we were going to bring the world right to, the, right to our doorstep, and then we were going to take our manufacturing might, and we were going to open markets all around the world just by putting our stuff on ships. There was a problem. We built it. There's another clip of the yeah, furs. If you go down to the Milwaukee port today, it's mostly salt and coal. And the reason is we built the seaway. Big as it is, it's too small. It doesn't really reflect uh, the modern shipping fleet. They, they built the, the seaway portion in the 1950s to match the, the Welland Canal that was in existence at the time. And that Welland Canal was built in the 1930s. So we basically opened in the 1950s in the, you know, age of space exploration, um, a navigation channel that was more appropriate for the 19 teens. And uh, here's some clips of just how exquisitely tight it is. And, and this is important. Just try to remember this image when we talk a little bit down the road about the front door and the back door. Uh, there are places on the St. Lawrence Seaway. I think this is the Eisenhower Lock in upstate New York. But all the locks are the same size, so every boat coming into the lake has to go through this exquisitely tight pinch point. It's about 80 feet wide. And there's a place, I don't think this is the lock, where you can actually drive your car under the St. Lawrence Seaway. So to think that you know, our ports have you know, this natural connection to the outside world is to fundamentally misunderstand that this is uh, you know, almost a completely man-made system. Okay. Here's another picture of how tight it is. I can't imagine living in this house. You gotta like boats, I guess. <laughs> That's in the Thousand Island area. So, so we didn't get the cargoes that we hoped for. In that first year, we were getting, in Milwaukee, like 11 of these overseas ships a day. Today, we average about one a week. Um, we opened the door and, and, and the cargoes didn't come flooding in, or at least the cargoes that we were expecting. What we got was some stuff that we didn't expect. This would be the dreaded uh, sea lamprey. And the sea lamprey was the first invasive species to really you know, demonstrate how fragile, how ecologically vulnerable these, these baby lakes were. Uh, the, the lamprey made its way up uh, the canal system. You could say honestly, it finned its way up, it swam its way in, it wasn't carried by any boat or anything. And the first one appeared above, I don't know why it took so long, it took them a while, or maybe they were just laying low, but the first one appeared in Lake Erie in 1921, and lampreys make their living by their parasites. They, they attach themselves to the bellies of their prey fish. And this is a picture that's, that's in the book. That's a lake trout, and that's a lamprey attached to its belly. And it's basically like a vampire. It just sucks the blood out. One lamprey can kill 
40 pounds of lake trout in you know, the year and a half it's swimming in the open waters of the lakes. And that's, that's not really that impressive of a number, but this is. In the early 1940s, Lake Michigan was yielding some six million pounds of lake trout annually. We were fishing the heck out of the lakes. Um, and, and this is an interesting side note. A big reason was it was safe fishing during World War II. You didn't have to bring these trawlers off the coast, which you know, they were vulnerable to, to attacks, or at least the perception of, of that. Um, so we fished the lakes hard, but the lampreys hit the, hit the lakes even harder. We were getting six million pounds a year out of Lake Michigan in the early 40s, and by uh, the late 1940s or early 1950s, that number was literally zero. Uh, the, the lampreys just took out the lake trout. We decided to take out the lampreys. <laughs> um, the guy that was holding that fish made it his life's work to figure out the, the lampreys vulnerable point and it basically is that it spawns in relatively few lakes and streams and it's also a very ancient critter. It's, uh, there's fossils that have been found that are 350 million years old or so and it's left with a very, this leaves it with a very crude liver and so the idea was if they could find a poison that would be lamprey specific. They wouldn't have to dump it in the open water. They could dump it in the lakes and the streams in which the lamprey spawned and take them out in that pinch point and, and you knock them out. And so by the early 1960s, we were, we were dosing the Great Lakes, the tributaries, the rivers feeding the Great Lakes uh, to the point that we were able to knock down lamprey populations to about 10% of what they were during their peak. That was good news. The bad news was behind the lampreys came another uh, invasive species that swam its way into the lake, and that was the, uh, the alewife, which is an ocean herring. It swam in, and with no lake trout or big fish to eat it, it just went, it went to town. And by the mid-1960s, Lake Michigan was estimated to be, the fish mass biomass in Lake Michigan was estimated to be 90% alewives. For every nine pounds of fish swimming in the lake, 10 pounds, nine was an alewife. And they were great at breeding in the lakes, but because they were a true ocean fish, they were vulnerable to die-offs. Their kidneys were under constant stress to keep their salinity balanced appropriately. And so they would have these massive die-offs by the billions. This is Chicago. I'd imagine some people in this room probably remember the dark days of the mid-1960s when the lakes were basically useless. I mean, there, there was no commercial fish to be, to be caught out there. And when you went to the beach, you, if you didn't gag, uh, you didn't stay long because it was just a, a, rotting, a rotting mass. I'm just going to read two paragraphs here because, and these aren't my words, the, this is how a UPA, UPI news report characterized this infestation in the summer of 1967, in July 1967, the year and the month I was born. Quote, Chicago was running out of places to bury dead fish, out of money for their removal, and out of people to do that work. A dozen park districts quit their job in olfactory disgust. Morale among those remaining was described as low. <laughs> so, what to do? Um, you know, we, we, we got rid of the, the, the dreaded parasite, or got control of the parasite that was the lamprey, and the logical step would be to bring back the lake trout that it destroyed, remnant populations of which still persisted on Lake Superior, but humans being humans, um, we, we figured we could, we could not only fix the problem, but we could give the lakes an upgrade. And that's when we brought in these salmon. And this is where I first got interested in this whole issue. And, and this guy here, is, he is the, the godfather of the Great Lakes Salmon Program. His name is Howard Tanner. He's 94 or so now. Um, he's a great guy. And he, he, he's also very confident that he's the man who fixed the lakes. And he did for a little while. Um, if you've got to think about how bizarre this is, you've got this Atlantic herring that swam its way into the middle of the continent. And then we literally fly out from Oregon. I mean, they, they were given, you know, tickets on a TC-29 or something and brought, brought to uh, Midwest hatcheries, raised and planted to eat alewives. Nobody knew how, how this was going to work. And Michigan didn't consult any other state. I mean, can you imagine this happening today? Um, I actually can. Uh, it's kind of frightening. <laughs> but, but, but it's just remarkable that uh, one state can decide that this is what we're going to do. Because obviously these fish don't know the state, <laughs> the state lines that are, you know, mythically painted on the bottom of the lakes. 
And, uh, but Howard, Howard hit a home run. Home run. I mean, he, he turned a wasteland into what's been estimated as a $7 billion fishery. This was at the peak. So this, is, this picture doesn't really capture it, but what was so interesting was that the lakes were dead to so many people for, to, for so long that they didn't really understand how powerful uh, and treacherous they are. You know, I, I heard a couple weeks ago they were expecting 18-foot waves on Lake Superior, and a couple years ago Michigan had a 20-foot wave recorded at a mid-lake uh, buoy. People were going out in canoes, like six or seven miles, to chase this exotic bounty. And um, this picture, I think, was taken from the, the September, I think it was 1968 or 69, when a storm came in and um, dozens had to be rescued from helicopters. I think seven or eight people died. But it was, it was a resounding success from the late 1960s to, um, to almost today. Uh, the problem is these invasions didn't stop with lampreys and alewives. The next wave came not by swimming up the, uh, the, the seaway channels on their own, but in the ballast water of these ocean-going freighters, the few that still do come to the Great Lakes, uh, about one uh, a day now during the nine-month shipping season. That, that, uh, that um, stream you see coming out of the side of the boat, that's ballast water. And they can, one, one of these ships can carry like six million gallons of ballast water, and it's used to balance a ship on the open seas. The problem is, it's not dead weight, it's anything but. And that's how we now have 100, and it's a running number, 86, 87, 88, uh, non-native species in the Great Lakes. None of them have been more devastating than this little bugger and its cousin, the, uh, the zebra mussel. You look at that and you think, how much trouble can that be? Um, but, and, and I don't think I'm being too extreme here, you gotta look at it as like a cancer cell because it's just one of trillions. Um, this is a, a picture from northern uh, Lake Michigan. Those are just dead, dead shells. Uh, zebra mussels came in the late 1980s, and right behind them were a very closely related uh, mussel from the same place, the Caspian Sea Basin, brought in the same way, uh, in ballast water from an ocean-going freighter. And the zebra mussels were just like an appetizer. The quagga mussels have just done a number like you cannot believe on, well, let's look at Lake Michigan. The top graphic shows the muscle density of zebra mussels. They can't live at, 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 at great depths of water, and they can't filter year-round. Quagga mussels are a little bit bigger. They can live at almost any depth. They filter year-round, and they're now blanketing the bottom of Lake Michigan at densities up to 100,000 per square meter. And you may think that's impossible, but they stack on top of each other almost like coral. And the, you know, the biologists that I work with at uh, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee say we could walk, if we drained Lake Michigan, we could walk across the lake on a bed of quagga mussels all the way to, to Muskegon, Michigan. Um, they, are, they are, each one of them can filter a liter of water a day. So they are literally sucking the life out of the lakes. And so the, the first round of invasions we had was really a top of the food chain phenomenon. This is a bottom of the food chain phenomenon. They're locking up all that energy. And this is a quick graphic just showing, you don't have to look too hard at it, but that, that's, those, are the, those are the prey fish in the lake, the, the lake the, or the, the prey base in the lake. They're basically what the salmon and what's left of the lake trout depend on. And you, if you look at it, it's just crashed. I mean, the, the lake has just been gutted. And the result is in many ways grim. This is the last commercial fishing boat in Milwaukee uh, the picture's actually taken up off the Door Peninsula. The last commercial fisherman sailed his boat up there in 2011 to go fishing with his dad one last time, and we went out with him from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Uh, he, he moved to Alaska. After we were fishing on this day, we went to the cottage that they were staying in, and he was talking to his parents. He was a fourth-generation commercial fisherman. He was talking to his parents about why he's leaving, and he's taking his kids with him and the grandparents are losing the grandkids, and the mom is crying, she's sobbing, and uh, he said to her, you know, I'm not leaving this lake. The lake left me. It's, it's gone. And it's not just on Lake Michigan. This, this sad guy, I, uh, I came across him on Lake Huron, and he had just moved back from, from California, uh, and it was, it was the fall salmon run, or it should have been, 
this was in 2014 or 15, and he brought his buddy up, and you know, they, he remembered the great salmon runs of the 1980s, and when I saw him, he was just sitting there forlorn, asking what the heck happened. Um, it's an ongoing story, and we're gonna get back to this in a second. But I wanna jump to, I talked about the front door. This is the back door. This is the Chicago Canal. I showed the picture of the Great Lakes Basin at the beginning. Um, what Chicago did was they destroyed the basin dividing line. It's, it's river, the Chicago River used to flow into Lake Michigan. This, this canal sucked Lake Michigan out in, across the Continental Divide and into the Mississippi River Basin. The reason they did it was Chicago was choking on its own filth. Um, they, were, they were sending their sewage into Lake Michigan and they were pulling their drinking water from Lake Michigan and lots of people were getting sick, so this was a matter of survival and it made a lot of sense at the time, just as did the St. Lawrence Seaway. So here's a picture of the Mississippi River Basin and you can see up in Chicago, you know, it, the map doesn't even really reflect it, but that was not part of the Great Lakes Basin until this river was, was, was constructed in 1900. So look at, it's 40% of the continental United States is all of a sudden connected to the Great Lakes by this 160 foot wide channel that didn't just carry filth, it also carries fish. <laughs> uh, the, this is a dreaded big, -headed, big head carp. They, they are going great guns in the Mississippi River Basin and had Chicago not reversed its canal or built this canal, they would not have a direct pathway into the Great Lakes, but because we do now have this linkage to the outside world, we have the threat of this species, which is not insignificant. Uh, they can grow to over a, 100 pounds and eat up to 20% of their weight a day in plankton. Um, the only thing that's keeping them out of Lake Michigan right now is an electric fish barrier that has a history of, of failing. And um, if they get into the lakes, there's really no telling uh, what's going to happen. You know, one U.S. official once said it's just a matter of time until they become a carp pond, which would really be a tragedy. There's two species of fish. This is the big head. This is the slightly smaller silver carp. Uh, these are the notorious jumping fish. I don't know if you've ever seen any of the YouTube videos, but these things get agitated by the whir of a boat motor, and they jump out, and, you know, the researchers that I work with, they won't go out on the river now without uh, hockey helmets. I was out with this guy one day. This is on the Illinois River, which is connected to the Mississippi. His name is Orion Briney, and Orion caught 13,000 pounds of these silver carp in one day. He, he, he would chase them into nets, and he could see the water riffling, and then they'd start popping, and he would drive them. He was like a rancher. He'd drive them into the nets, and then he'd pull the nets, and he'd fill up his John boat, this day was 13,000 pounds, a typical catch. That same year, the, the total harvest, commercial harvest for perch on all of Lake Michigan, it had been reduced, the, the fishery on Lake Michigan for perch had been reduced to the Bay of Green Bay, was 20,000 pounds. So what we were pulling in a year out of Lake Michigan, he was almost pulling in a day out of, uh, out of the Illinois River. And, and these fish actually get sent um, to China. They, they're processed and um, it's a very popular fish food, and the, the, yeah, they taste okay. I, I had fish and chips, and um, it tasted like fish. Uh, I just don't know how much fish you want to be eating out of the Illinois River. Um, the problem with this canal, with the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal, this back door, if you will, is that it's a two-way street, Stuff is migrating toward the Great Lakes and stuff is spilling out of the Great Lakes. In 2007, so, so just backing up, this map here, boom, that's all zebra and quagga mussel habitat once, you know, once this canal became a reality, and it became a reality back in 1900. But nobody was thinking about, ooh, what's the wisdom in, in doing this? So zebra mussels and quagga mussels spread like cancer through the Mississippi River Basin and they were eventually towed over the Continental Divide um, and first appeared in Lake Mead. This is in 2009. I went out here and talked to this guy. He was the first, this is not the first mussel found, but he was with a, with a coworker, the first guy to find a mussel. They didn't know what it was. What's interesting, if you look at his hands closely, 
uh, they're all cut up, and that's because these things are, are razor sharp. And so when they got out west, they made short work of the west's waters, which are much warmer, the chemistry is perfect. And so 2007, they were finding one. By 2009, the canyon walls were just black with these mussels. This is a, I think this is a B-29 uh, bomber that crashed in Lake Mead. And this picture was taken in 2009, two years after the first mussel was discovered. And you look at it now, and it's just, you know, it, the, whole, the whole lake has just fundamentally changed in, in just a matter of years. And they're doing everything they can to keep these mussels from spreading into the uh, Pacific North, Northwest. They have these checkpoints. I want to just back up a second. They have these checkpoints at the boat ramps out west, and uh, you know, they're, they're looking for the potential uh, for somebody to be bringing in mussels. And if you're coming from a Great Lakes state, or if you have a, a wet hull, or there's some bilge water, they're going to make you get a, uh, basically a hot pressure wash, which will, will kill zebra mussels and quagga mussels. If you skip your, your turn in this line and, and go around one of these checkpoints, you can end up paying uh, $5,000. Even if you're a local guy, say, on Lake Powell in Page, Arizona, and you have a jet ski, and everybody knows you only jet ski on Lake Powell, if you don't get your, your, your vessel checked, you're going to the courthouse. And some people were actually threatened with, with jail time. I mean, the lengths that they're going is, is just remarkable. $5,000 fines. They were, they were actually uh, hot spray washing swimming noodles when I was out there because they were wet. Okay. $5,000 for a jet boat. These seaway freighters that are coming in through the front door, the way it works now, they have to flush their ballast tanks with mid-ocean salt water. The hope is that it will expel or kill any unwanted hitchhikers. If, if they don't do that, um, they have to agree not to discharge their ballast water. And every ship coming in the seaway gets tested. And if it has salt water in its tanks, then it's good, it's good to go. If it doesn't, it has to promise not to discharge that water. If it does discharge that water, and as I mentioned earlier, they can carry up to six million gallons of, of this ballast water from anywhere on Earth. The fine when I was doing this reporting in 2014 was uh, $3,000. So, you know, and, and if you remember that picture of how exquisitely tight that pinch point is at the front door, if you keep those doors shut, not to boats necessarily, but to the bad stuff that they're carrying, you save a continent's worth of trouble. They're now estimating that if, if these, these mussels, which gum up pipes and drinking water systems, get into the Columbia River Basin, they, they can do a billion dollars worth of damage to infrastructure per year. And at this point, you know, we're getting one ship a day, and we're still getting invasive species. We've gotten, I believe, four in the last two years, um, despite the industries, and it is, I mean, they have done a lot, but they're not doing enough. This door is still open, and it's not just something that should frighten people out west. This is provided to me by the University of Wisconsin. It's a bicycle pulled from Lake Mendota, um, I think last year or the year before. Zebra mussels turned up in Lake Mendota for the first time, I think it was in 2015. And this is, this is my point, I guess. What happens in the Great Lakes matters to everyone in the country because the Great Lakes really are just a beachhead for all these biological invasions to take hold. Once we open those doors to those ships sailing up the seaway, these species are going to hop on a boat ride, um, on currents, and they're going to spread, and it's going to become a continent-wide problem. It's not just a matter of changing the name of the things that are living in the lakes. The mussels can so fundamentally disrupt the way energy flows that they really are a biological form of biological pollution. And I would imagine this is an issue here on Lake Mendota, these toxic uh, blue-green algae outbreaks. And the mussels are, are implicated in this because while they're brainless, they are smart enough <laughs> to eat everything that's floating in the water but this toxic algae. So, so when you get a bloom now, it's basically selected. It's, it's basically given this toxic algae uh, a, a running start. And so in the 1960s, you'd have an algal bloom and it could be a whole assemblage of species. And now, you know, this, this is Lake Mendota, but on Lake Erie, 
the plumes are, they span the 2,000 square miles uh, at times, and they've knocked out the drinking water to um, cities as large as Toledo. And you can't just boil the water to fix it because that only increases the toxin that's in, in this algae. So uh, it is a biological problem, a pollution problem, every bit as vexing as anything that's coming out of a, a smokestack or a pipe. It's actually worse because it breeds. Um, we need to fix the ballast water problem. And it's not, it, 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 it's, it's not an easy problem to fix, but it is fixable. This is a picture of the SS Eastland in 1915 in the Chicago River. This is what happens when a boat is improperly ballasted. As I mentioned earlier, the ballast water is put in special tanks around a boat to, to give it a balance. And, and this, this boat did not have its ballast water uh, in the right place. And when people boarded the boat, it rolled slowly and it killed almost 900 people who were on their way down to uh, uh, Indiana to spend a, a company picnic at the dunes. It was, it was just a disaster. What we, what we need to do is we need to get the attention of the shipping industry to the point where they are, are, are better partners at working with us. They have taken big steps. They've agreed to flush their water, their ballast water with salt water, which has gone a long way to reducing the number of organisms in a ballast tank. But, you know, it's like um, uh, Jurassic Park. You know, life, life finds a way. This, this, you, you may think a glass of water is just a glass of water. That's, that's a drop of seawater. <laughs> that's what's lurking in there. It's been filtered and concentrated. But, but this is anything but dead weight. The shipping industry has been sued, and, and they're being forced to uh, put uh, ballast water treatment systems on their vessels. Uh, so they can do as much as, as, as scientifically and humanly possible at this point to keep the next invasion from happening. But at the same time, they're working with members of Congress to pull back the Clean Water Act protections that, the, that mandate this kind of treatment. So we can't go backwards right now. You know, the, the, knowing what we know, it would just, it would just boggle my mind that we would, we would loosen protection for the Great Lakes. And, you know, you might say, well, it's already kind of a lost cause. And it, it's not. You know, I had that sad, sorry fisherman sitting on the banks of uh, Lake Huron a few slides back. This isn't all bad news. This is another invasive species. It came from the same place as the zebra and quagga mussels, the Caspian Sea Basin. It came the same way aboard an overseas ship sailing up the seaway. And this little bugger uh, is a nuisance to anybody who's trying to fish with bait because they're very smart and they will nibble the bait right off your hook, but they're also nature built to eat mussels. So they're unlocking the energy that is or has been before this, you know, tied up in, in these mussel shells. And anything that can eat a goby is doing all right. And gobies are everywhere. This is an interesting picture. This is the bottom of Lake Michigan. That's a piece of research equipment, those two flaps. Um, this is a, a native uh, type of algae called cladophora. And all the white stuff below that are, are zebra or quagga mussels. And the, the cladophora is growing on it. And that's like all you see until you circle the gobies. <laughs> there they are. They're, they're everywhere. They're the largest uh, small fish out in the lakes now. And it just so happens that uh, the salmon fishery that is collapsing um, is collapsing because the salmon will not deign to go to the bottom and bang their noses into the rocks and grub out a living on gobies. But native lake trout do. And native lake trout are now making a comeback like never since the um, arrival of the lampreys in the 1940s. And we're getting to the point now where Lake Michigan and Lake Huron are looking at having a future of a self-sustaining uh, native lake trout population. Whitefish, native species, they're not technically, uh, typically, a piscivore, a fish-eating fish. But if it's death or a goby, they'll take a goby. And you talk to the commercial fishermen, and there's, these fish don't have teeth, so they have to eat these gobies whole. And the commercial fishermen 
telling me that they, they come in and, and the, the white fish have their cheeks ripped open from getting their mouths around these fish. They're saying it's evolution on, on the fly, and it, it in a way is. Walleye are doing great. Not far from where that guy was sitting. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. But Lake uh, Huron has a spectacular walleye fishery, and it's making a huge comeback on Green Bay and on Lake Erie as well. So what we're seeing is kind of the top of the food chain stitching itself back together with these native species. The bottom of the food chain may look more like the Caspian Sea than, than the native Great Lakes, but there's a balance. And, you know, I think nature does a very good job of finding a balance if we can just give it a breather, if we can just stop these invasions from constantly roiling the lakes. Nobody can predict what the next species is going to do. Maybe it slips in and without making a ripple, or maybe it, you know, is the next zebra mussel. So vigilance is the order of the, the word of the day. And, you know, people ask, what can I do? Well, pay attention uh, to, 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 to what's going on in the Senate. It's, it's a perennial bill. It'll be coming up again this year, I'm sure, to try to roll back Clean Water Act protections for the Great Lakes in terms of ballast water. But another thing you can do and should do, and it doesn't have to be a Great Lake, any body of water you live on, make sure your kids have a history with it. You know, I would, like I said at the beginning, I wouldn't be standing here if I didn't have these Great Lakes imprinted on me as a child. This is, this is me and my brothers. I believe that's Lake Superior sometime probably in the early 1970s. And these trips matter. And it doesn't have to be Lake Superior, it can be Lake Mendota, any lake, any body of water. You just got to make sure that the next generation has an ethic, an experience with the lakes, so they have an ethic for taking care of them, because we let that slip in the 1960s, and we paid dearly for it. And this is my last picture, taking, taking my son out for a quick swim after a, a victory over the Chicago Bears <laughs> on Lake Michigan, <laughs> three blocks from my house. Thanks a lot. We're going to do a question and answer, and uh, somebody's going to be joining me on the stage here. Jake Vanderzand. I think it's just you. All right, and so you're going to, I guess you're going to stand over here. Okay, sure. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Hello, thank you. All right. Um, I am uh, Jake Vanderzanden. I'm the director of the Center for Limnology and the chair of water at UW-Madison, which is the cross-campus group of researchers who focus on water and water, water resources. Um, and I just would like to say a thank you on behalf of all of the UW-Madison community to Dan Egan for coming here and spending a few days with us on campus, visiting classrooms, giving this talk, and, and meeting with people here. Um, it's been fantastic. Thank you. And Dan, also as a limnologist and a freshwater person, I'd also like to thank you for telling the wonderful interconnected story of the Great Lakes through uh, writing your book, which I think many of us have enjoyed. If you haven't read it already, please do. It is an absolutely fantastic book, and I, I feel that we here at UW-Madison are really privileged to have had this book chosen as our Go Big Read this, this year. And uh, as a limnologist, I would say to uh, uh, Chancellor Blank, if you want to choose limnology-themed books in the future, I am totally supportive of that. So thank <laughs> you for choosing this book. Um, all right, um, one other announcement I'd like to make is that uh, tomorrow, Dan will be making another public event appearance, which is at 5.30 p.m. at Working Draft Brewery on East Wilson Street. Um, and so this is gonna be a science on tap type event. Have a beer, have a relaxed conversation with Dan. So don't all come because it's a very small place, but if at least some of you come, that would be great. Um, 
All right, um, so my job here is to moderate the question period. And um, apparently the way this will work is that there are two uh, microphones in the back. So one here and one here. And if you are interested in asking a question, you can just line up behind the microphones and we will alternate between the two, starting with uh, that one back there. I would also like to make it clear that we are looking for questions, not statements. So in other words, your, um, whatever you say needs to have a question mark at the end. So uh, just making that clear. All right, so um, let's, let's get going. Um, this is our opportunity. Is there someone there? All right, go ahead. Hi, I uh, am wondering two questions. Uh, why did the walleyes decline in Lake Superior? And it looks like the quagga mussels will eat themselves out of life. Is that accurate? I don't know the walleye situation on Lake Superior. The, the quagga question, yeah, you know, I think the way the invasion biologists say, explained it is, you know, a species takes off and then reaches its carrying capacity and then crashes. But the problem is, is that hasn't happened yet. I mean, there, there's something, you know, nature hates a vacuum and it also hates a bunch of protein tied up in these shells on the bottom of Lake Michigan, it's something, or bottom of the Great Lakes. Something's gonna, something's gonna take, take them out at some point. It could be a virus. It could be, I mentioned these two, these two Asian species of Asian carp. There's, there's a third species called black carp and uh, they're actually mollusk eaters, and they actually get bigger than the, the big head carps. They, they can grow to about 140 pounds, and they're actually loose down in the Mississippi River Basin, and the, you know, the fish farmers that imported these fish actually wanted to bring them to Wisconsin a number of years back to demonstrate their muscle-crunching prowess, and they promised that they would bring in sterilized version of these carp, and the, the Wisconsin <laughs> Department of Natural Resources said Ab absolutely not. But you, you are right, you know, this isn't, this isn't the way things are going to stay. The question is, what's next? And, you know, it's always winners and losers. Uh, the pace of the change, though, is, is really what's important because things, evolution happens, species change, dynamics change, but what's going on right now is happening so fast that it, 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 it's just incredibly disruptive. And I mentioned Toledo losing its drinking water. These invasive species have been tied to botulism outbreaks in some of the most pristine areas of the Great Lakes at Sipping Bear Dunes. Um, they are a serious threat, and um, they're not going away anytime soon. Question over here. Uh, yeah. Um, what can we do to, like, stop the blue-green algae, like, blooming? Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're really, if you had a bunch of levers to fix this problem, none of them would work because you know, one of the factors is temperature. Um, one of the factors is the fact that these, these mussels are now not eating that algae, so, so they're surviving when nothing else is. The one, the one lever we could pull is, is how much nutrients are going into the lake or the lakes, and that's driven largely by sewer overflows and by agriculture. And we can control that, but it's going to come with some significant costs, both in terms of sewage treatment upgrades or to, to agriculture. And nobody, nobody wants to see a farmer struggle any more than they already are. At the same time, nobody wants to show up at the beach on a hot July afternoon and have to turn away because their water is poisoned. We can, we can figure this out. You know, we, we, we got into a fix with algae back in the 1960s and we, we mandated uh, phosphorus reductions in terms of the content that was in uh, laundry and dishwashing detergent. Now, now it's, it's, it's more agriculture, um, but we can still have our milk in lakes too. That's a good question. From the back. One of the things I learned from your book is the notion that um, the clearest lake isn't necessarily the healthiest lake. Do you think looking five years down in the future, that there may be a tension between pressures for use of our clear, fresh water uh, that mitigates against interest in restoring the full health of Lake Michigan? Yeah, you know, it is spectacular, the, the, the color of the lake. I remember when I first moved back, I was on a boat going out to Washington Island from the tip of the Door Peninsula, 
And, and you could see down as a kid, I remember just looking into a brothy green and now you could, you know, see the cracks between the rocks and um, it's all because of the muscles. And that is kind of on a intuitive level, it's very appealing. It kind of makes you think of the Caribbean. But that's really, you know, as I write in the book, that's not a healthy lake. That's a lake getting the life sucked out of it. And while people might like the way it looks from say, a skyscraper in Chicago or an airplane flying over the lakes or a bluff in Milwaukee. Um, it's, it's, it's really a bad news for the lake. And I'll give you a, a quick... A qu I, made, I made reference to these botulism outbreaks on, on uh, sleeping bear dunes on the other side of the lake. This is, this is how it's bad news. So the mussels have cleared up the lake to the point where vegetation can grow at depths that it never could before. That vegetation is largely this cladophora that we just showed in the slide toward the end of the presentation. That cladophora eventually dies and burns up massive amounts of oxygen to the point where the water is almost anoxic. Um, that opens the door for a botulism bacteria to thrive. Along come these gobies. They eat mussels that have sucked up this, uh, this toxin and then the gobies are poisoned. They float to the surface and then unsuspecting birds, like uh, loons and I don't know how many species, but they've been dying by the tens of, the, tens of thousands since the, the mid-1990s. So at the same time, you'll see national pictures of like uh, uh, shipwrecks on the bottom of Lake Michigan taken by Coast Guard helicopter pilots because the water is so crystalline and people think, oh, this is a good sign. That's, it's a simplistic way of looking at it. You're right, though, that people are, you know, getting used to the idea of these Caribbean clear lakes, but that's, that's not a, a well-functioning lake at all. Okay, next question. Please give us an update of the situation of the carp in Chicago since your book was published. Okay, so they, they have this electric fence. It's actually three electric fences, and, and they're, they're basically electrifying the water. Uh, to, keep, to repel the carp, not to kill them, but they, they start swimming up and they get a shock and they turn around and, and they don't go forward. This was never meant to be a long-term solution. As a matter of fact, that barrier was originally built to stop, uh, I think it was gobies, uh, from getting out of the Great Lakes. But by the time the barrier was built, the gobies had gotten into the Mississippi River Basin, so we repurposed it and made it a barrier from the other direction. There's been studies done what it would take to plug that Chicago Canal to sever this artificial connection between the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River Basin, which spans 40% of the continental United States, some 1.2 million square miles. Um, and it can be done, and it can be done in a manner that we can still have uh, sewage flowing you know, down the canal and, and boats flowing up it, but uh, so far, there hasn't been the political will to do it. What it would take is basically plugging it and, put, and building a, a transfer facility. Um, then there's always the question, well, what if somebody just plants a carp? What if we spend three billion, one estimate was as high as 18 billion, which I think was overblown, but what if we spend these billions of dollars and somebody just dumps a carp in the lake anyway? That's a legitimate question. But, but this isn't just about carp. This is about Chicago managing its water. Um, in the 21st century because it, it did the right thing by 19th uh, century standards, 20th century, early 20th century standards. But, but now they're basically using Lake Michigan as a big toilet tank, not bowl. They use the tank, they use it as a tank to flush their effluent uh, down the Mississippi towards St. Louis. Um, they're just beginning now at some of the treatment facilities to actually disinfect their sewage. But prior to that, prior to only like five years ago, Chicago was not disinfecting its, its sewage. It was just dumping it in the canal and letting nature bake the bad stuff out. No other city uh, like Chicago was given uh, the permission to do this through the Environmental Protection Agency. Their legal argument is essentially that this canal is a three-sided pipe. Um, it's, it's, it's not a regular water body, it's a sewer. Um, so, so we can fix this by, by plugging the canal and by demanding that Chicago treat its, its, its uh, effluent, its wastewater, to the same standards that Madison, Milwaukee, um, any other city in the Great Lakes is, is held to. 
it, it is going to be expensive, um, but, but we have to weigh the costs and the consequences of not doing something. All right, next question here. Thank you for your talk tonight, Dan. Um, I was wondering if you could speak at all to the impact that uh, the building of the Foxconn plant um, yeah. on Lake Michigan will have, because they'll be taking in millions um, of gallons of water yeah. from Lake Michigan, and I think I'd be upset if we didn't address it tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the question. You know, um, what, was so, what was so inspiring about the Great Lakes Compact that we passed in 2008, which prohibits large-scale diversions of Great Lakes water to other areas of the country, was that we acted in unity, in unison, as, as a region with one voice. All eight Great Lakes states signed on to this compact, and the two Canadian provinces uh, entered into a parallel agreement as well. And, you know, it allows for some diversions, provi provided that water is taken back, treated, and put back in the lakes. Now, what's going on with Foxconn? They're going to take about 7 million gallons, as I understand it, 7 million gallons a day. And, and they're going to take it over this basin line where, um, unless there were some pipes, it would flow into the Mississippi River Basin and it would disappear. That's not going to happen. It's, it's, they're going to be required to send it back into Lake Michigan, which is good. But, and that's how the compact is, is supposed to work. The concern is, is what kind of shape is this water going to be in when it goes back? And, you know, the con the compact really is largely an abstraction right now. Um, we, we are sending water, we will be sending water from, from Lake Michigan over, over the Continental Divide to Waukesha, and they'll be sending it back. That's the provision of the contact. You compact. You basically have to engineer yourself into the basin. But this, isn't, this Foxconn thing isn't about water quantity, it's about water quality. And are we going to hold them to the standards that they need to be held to I think that's still an open question. Um, you know, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources will say, say yeah, but you've got seven other states that are looking very warily at you know, how rigidly we're going to enforce um, Clean Water Act protections. For uh, I don't know what the process is for building these flat screens, but it's, it's, it's not taking water and running them across a, a glass panel and sending it back. They're, they're doing a lot of stuff with that water. Next question. Back, <coughs> back to a, a less politically charged, less exciting question. Um, so we're concerned that the big head carp and the silverfin will get to the Great Lakes and destroy them. And that's the issue with the Chicago uh, Canal. Uh, some people argue that since they Mussels are filtering the lake. They are pretty much dead. The carp are not going to thrive there as they are doing on the Illinois River. So we're really worried about something that's not going to happen. Uh, how confident are you that the carp will destroy the lake if they make their way up there if they haven't yet? And also, if that would were to happen, what's preventing us from making money out of it. <laughs> yeah, you know, th th that's a good question. And as a non-biologist, I don't have confidence in anything. <laughs> but um, as I understand it, yeah, we, you know, to a large degree, these mussels, they eat the same thing that the big head and the silver carp eat, and that's the plankton. And, and the mussels have really, sterilized is too strong of a word, but they've really stripped out the nutrients in the Great Lakes. That's why we're talking about it being crystalline. And when you compare that to the Illinois River where O'Brien, Orion Brining was hauling it in, I mean, that, that almost was like pea soup. So it, there is, I'm, I'm dubious that these fish are going to thrive out in the middle of the, lake, the lakes. That doesn't mean that they couldn't thrive in the tributaries and the bays that are much more, you know, nutrient enriched. Um, and that also happens to be where people recreate. And like I've mentioned these videos, you, ca you can't jet ski or water ski um, though some people wouldn't really have a problem if those went away. Uh, a lot of people, it still is a big industry and a lot of people have a lot of fun doing that. You wouldn't be able to do it on a heavily infested water. It's an unknown, but it's a, it's a question that we can, we can take off the table if we have the will to do it. And I, I just find the silver and the big head carp story just, just fascinating, you know. 
how they were brought over here. They could have, we could have eradicated them right away. The farmers who, fish farmers who brought them over didn't want them. They wanted a different species of carp. They turned them over to the uh, Arkansas Game and Fish Department, and they started using them in sewage treatment experiments uh, with federal funding. They were, they were putting them in sewage lagoons, and the idea was they would eat the goop in the lagoons, and then that was phase one. And then phase two was you pull the fish out of the lagoons and you sell them for food, <laughs> thereby funding more sewage treatment. And it's kind of an elegant idea. It is. <laughs> oh, but but once, once the FDA realized that the plan was to sell these, these sewage-fed fish to the public, they, they killed it, um, <laughs> and appropriately so. All right, are there any more questions? I don't see anyone at the microphones, although this is your chance. Okay, there's a question there, but it would be good to go to the microphone if you, well, speak really loudly. I don't know. I don't know. I, I read about that too. I've been a little bit out of the, out of the loop. I'm, I'm actually not doing daily newspaper reporting right now. But I do know that nobody's, nobody's really solved the, <laughs> solved the threat. And you know, I, I just want to go back a little bit and real quickly just to talk about the threat that they pose that they don't. Um, what I like about the carp from where I sit as a journalist, what I, it's not like is not the right word, but what's important about the carp is that, you know, we have 186, 187 non-native species in the Great Lakes, and for, for years nobody cared. And, and now, you know, these things are charismatic. They jump, they, you know, they send boaters to the hospital. That's bad. But they got people's attention. So now we care about 188, number 188, what it might be. It may not be a carp. It could be a virus, which would be, you know, that's where the real, the real killing goes on. The real damage to the lakes is going on at the microscopic level, which... Um, you know, but if, but if these big, ugly fish can, can bring that kind of awareness, then they're providing a service. Question back here. Um, my question is, why didn't the commercial fishery um, people have a voice loud enough to say, we want our trout back? Yeah. And also, you mentioned that the trout, if they would be coming back in big enough numbers, could take care of the goby problem. But if the goby has botulism, won't we have... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, 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 all, that all makes sense. Um, <laughs> so, so this goby problem with the botulism isn't, isn't uh, widespread. They're still trying to figure out the mechanisms at play, and it seems to be concentrated pretty much in, uh, in the northern part of... the northeastern part of Lake Michigan. The lake trout are never going to... They're never going to get rid of the gobies. The gobies are, are here um, until something weird happens, or something that we, we don't, we're not expecting happens, which will happen, I guess, at some point. Um, why didn't the lake trout fishermen fight harder? They did. And, you know, in Michigan, they got crushed. They basically said, no, this is no longer a commercial fishery. This is going to be more valuable to us as a recreational fishery. And they pulled licenses. The Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources tried harder to maintain both a commercial and a recreational fishery. But when push came to shove, or comes to shove, the DNR is probably going to go with the recreational fishery. To the point that these alewives that I was talking about, you know, they were a cockroach of a fish for years and years until they became the fuel for the salmon industry. And then we started, like, we're just humans, we just always want more, more, more. We, we were putting in, I forgot the number, but uh, more than 10 million salmon into Lake Michigan a year by the 1980s to the point where the lake just couldn't handle it and the salmon started to starve and they were dying from a, from a, a, bacterial, a kidney, bacterial kidney disease. Wisconsin went to the point, uh, this, is, this is in the late 80s, by the early 90s, Wisconsin basically designates the uh, alewife as a, as a threatened species and starts managing it <laughs> as such. And they also went so far as to talk about raising alewives in hatcheries to, uh, to keep the salmon going. It's like the old lady in the f swallowing the fly at some <laughs> level. All right, back here. Um, other than every single person in this room voting, 
Um, what do you, any, uh, and you've touched on some of this, but any other suggestions about things we can do? Just, you know, and, and so we're talking about the Great Lakes, but I think it, it expands to all water bodies, and that is just to get a fundamental kind of literacy, how they work, how they function, what decisions are we making that are causing this to happen or that not to happen. So, so it comes with a basic understanding of your favorite lake, um, and then it comes with just getting engaged. And I'm a, I'm a newspaper reporter. I can't say, go do this, go do that, but I think it's safe to say that it never hurts if you have an issue to bend the ear of your representative. Um, you know, one of the problems with the Great Lakes is they're so big that people for years and years just thought that there was nothing that we could do to follow them up. And, and now we, we know that that's anything but true. And now we have a responsibility to do something about that. In the, in the book, you know, one of the things that I was really interested in is just kind of putting myself in the context of the times when these decisions were made. And I don't really see black hats and white hats in this story so much as just humans kind of blindly feeling their way through. And now we're a little less blind. You know, we have a better idea. We're also starting to appreciate the value of a group of lakes that holds some 20% of the fresh surface water available on the planet. And you read these stories about places like Cape Town coming within, you know, a few weeks of literally losing their water. We're sitting on an ecological and economic trove, and I don't think we're appreciating it to the point that we should be or protecting it. Back there. Um, hi. Um, can you touch on, like, prioritizing what type of water policy or regulations based on the research that you've done that we should probably be, you know, pioneering or champion to restore our lakes? Well, yeah, that's, let's look at the compact. You know, we're, it's, basically a, it's basically an eight-state agreement to say no to everybody else. And if we're going to do that, I think we have um, a responsibility to, to take care of, of the bounty that we have. And, and Foxconn, we're back, going back to Foxconn, this is, this is a, a crucial test for the compact. Are, are, are we just going to worry about quantity or are we going to really worry about quality? And so, you know, I guess the watchword is we don't go, we can't go backwards. You know, there's just more people and there's more people needing water. And if we, we use the lakes basically as nautical highways and as a waste receptacle for, you know, most of the white history with the you know, post settlements history of the lakes. Um, a, a new ethic is, I hope, emerging. And um, how that takes shape specifically with policies, I don't, I don't know. Um, but but I, I do think that, you know, here in the 21st century, we have an opportunity to, um, you know, leave the lakes for the next generation and beyond better than, better than we got them, because we got them. We, I being 51 years old, we, I kind of inherited a mess, and uh, as my generation did. And um, I don't want to see that happen for the next generations. Over here. Hey, Dan, Angela McKenzie. Hello, Angela McKenzie. Hello. Um, is Lake Nipigon the sixth great lake, or is that just, and if so, what's the ecological connection? And, um, or is it just a, a, a reference amongst my fishing buddies? Uh, it, it is not the Sixth Great Lake. It is connected to, um, to the Great Lakes artificially. They actually built a, a, a canal. It used to be in the Hudson Bay watershed. It's a spectacular lake. My 15-year-old daughter tells me she spent uh, 15 days up there kayaking this summer. Um, but no, it, it is not a Great Lake. It's a really good lake. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I've got a funny story about Lake Nipigon, but I think uh, the brewers are <laughs> probably on people's minds. <laughs> All right, there's one question down here. Speak loudly. I'll repeat it. Yeah. 
Yeah. He, he's basically asking how durable is, is the Great Lakes Compact in this era when we, you know, we're, we're unraveling or rebuilding NAFTA. And, you know, I, I, would, I would not agree that the Waukesha water issue is a crack in the compact. The compact was basically a prescription to get Waukesha water because there's no way Wisconsin was going to sign off on any kind of a, a program that would prohibit a place like Waukesha getting water. And it was a similar dynamic in Ohio. And it was actually a pretty creative solution. It's like we can't, we can't rebuild these, they, they are continental divides, they call them subcontinental divides, but we can re-engineer them. We can, we can make the requirement that you take the water out, you treat it, and you put it back, just like anybody else who is in the basin. I do worry, though, that this unified voice that we spoke with back in 2008 could fracture. And, you know, I, I don't know the politics of unraveling a compact, but whatever Congress gives, Congress can take away. Um, which, which also reminds me of just this anti-regulatory uh, era that we're in, you know, regulations are big broad brushes often and everybody can tell a story of how a regulation worked them over in some unjust way. But think about 1969 when we had rivers that were burning and that wasn't a one-off deal. That river was burning a lot often and, and so that Cuyahoga River and so were rivers in Detroit and Buffalo um, all over the country. Who in their right minds thinks that it's, you know, a good idea to go back to those mythical <laughs> good old days? Um, you know, regulations are, are necessary. They, they, they can be burdensome and they can be poorly written, but that doesn't mean that you don't, you don't use them to accomplish uh, necessary goals. And it looks like we have one last question, and we'll call this our last question for the night. Uh, I think in your book uh, you talk about the Clean Water Act not uh, dealing well with agricultural runoff. Um, with the success that, was, that you demonstrated with the Fox River and paper mill uh, runoff, why is, it, why is there such resistance to, uh, to regulations in that regard with agricultural runoff? I don't know, um, but you know, I'll, I'll say one thing, and, and this is not a fully formed thought, and there's a bunch of people here, so I kind of feel a little exposed, but uh, the, you know, the opposition to CAFOs makes sense because we are overburdening these watersheds with manure, which is, you know, nutrients, which causes these algal blooms. But the, one of the first steps in, in pollution control is concentrating that pollution. And so I think there's opportunity here. You know, when we get these 8,000, 10,000 head uh, concentrated animal feed operations, we get a bunch of manure in one place. Now we can do something with it. You know, that's, it's valuable stuff. I'm actually working on a long project right now about phosphorus, and that stuff is, you know, thick with it. Um, you know, one cow can produce as much waste as I think 18 human beings, and up in aptly named Brown County, my home, my home county, uh, you know, not a drop of it's getting treated. And so, you know, this is a this is a, a sunny way of looking at it. But it, but I think it's legitimate. Um, the, the, these big operations are solving. I wouldn't call it half the problem, but the, they're they're beginning to solve the problem by concentrating it. And why, why don't we make these, these advancements with the Clean Water Act? That's a great question, because at the time it was thought this non-point, I hate that term, non-point source pollution, I just start thinking about something else the minute it comes <laughs> to my mind. But, but it is, you know, it's diffuse, and it, we don't have a smokestack to plug or a pipe to cap. Um, it's, on, it's, it's seeping off the landscape. Until it's in these sewage, or these, these manure lagoons on the CAFOs, now, now it's, it's a point. <laughs> it's not a non-point. And I think we have opportunities to, to deal with it then. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. And let's thank Dan one last time. Thank you. I really appreciate the interest. <laughs>